Okay, my name is Gregory Khalil. Um, I am with Telos, and I am uh, really honored to welcome two uh, remarkable friends of Telos, one from Tel Aviv, one from Haifa, Sarah Pearl and Jamal Shahade. Um, and we're here just to hear from them. Uh, the first principle of peacemaking, or practice of peacemaking rather, is listen to understand. And so we want to practice this today and listening to these folks beyond the headlines, what their experience was like, and most importantly, what they foresee in the future and how can we be involved in something that promotes security, dignity, freedom for both Palestinians and Israelis. Um, so tell us the Nonprofit based in Washington, D.C., our mission is to form communities of peacemakers across lines of difference uh, to help heal seemingly intractable conflict. Um, we do that in a variety of places, but our main issue area has always been America's relationship to Israel-Palestine, so-called Holy Land, where we, in fact, um, are heavily involved as Americans and particularly many of the faith communities that we work with. Um, we believe that the only way forward, only good future for anyone there, for either Palestinians or Israelis is one for everyone. So we promote security, dignity, freedom, and equal measure for all Palestinians um, and Israelis. We believe it's important to center human rights in this conversation that often gets overlooked. So with all of that said, I'm happy to, um, I'm happy to welcome folks in. And I'd, I'd love just our, our guest, um, Sarah from Tel Aviv, could you just tell us a little bit more about who you are um, professionally? Um, but most importantly, what have these last weeks been like for you? And what are you concerned about going forward? Um, or what opportunities might you, you see? Uh, thank you, Gregory. And hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. And I also would like to really thank those brave participants who have their camera on. It's really, really, uh, make, it makes a difference. So thank you. Uh, so my name is Sarah Pearl Benezra. I'm a storyteller, educator, peace activist. I live near Tel Aviv. I uh, was born in France. My family is originally from Algeria. And I've been working in the field of Israeli-Palestinian cooperation for the past 10 years. And to answer your question uh, about the past two weeks, it's it's been a lot. It's been a lot of emotions, a lot of um, of things to do, a lot of things to process. The truth is that when we knew that the truth of the ceasefire was supposed to come last night at 2 a.m., I kind of spent my night waiting for the last rockets to come. It was like, of course, they're going to want to show that you know it's they, they, that they won. And I understand that. And it happened already in 2014 and in 2011 uh, when there were rockets over Tel Aviv. So I really kind of spent my night waiting for the last rocket. And that's kind of the feelings I was in for the past two weeks. For part of it, I also was abroad. I was visiting, visiting my mom in France, which, who I haven't seen in almost two years. And my nights were spent moderating Facebook groups and WhatsApp groups of groups of Israeli and Palestinians because people were terrified. I also work a lot with teenagers. And it was about being, um, being a voice that reassures them and being an ear, a hear, an ear that can listen to their fears and their anxiety. Um, those were not normal weeks, even though violence is part of our normal somehow in the region, but those two last weeks were particularly intense. Well, um, I think most of us on this call can't imagine what these past weeks have been like for you um, and your families. Um, Jamal, you are up in Haifa, um, which is in Northern Israel. Um, many of our, our um, Telos trips have come to visit you and your, your ministry, House of Grace. Um, you're a Palestinian citizen of Israel. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about House of Grace very briefly, but also what these past two weeks have been like for you and, and your, your family? And you're on mute, Jamal. We can't hear you. Maybe take the headphones off. Can you hear me now? Oh, there. There you are. Yes. Okay. So, um,
Do you hear me now? Yes, we do. Yeah. Okay. Good. So, sorry for that. Um, Jamal Shahadi, I'm from uh, Haifa. I'm director of the House of Grace, uh, a ministry for uh, rehabilitation for released prisoners, uh, supporting families uh, and youth at risk. Um, I'm a father of two, married. Um, yeah, and uh, the past two weeks have been really intense, even though we are a little bit far off uh, all the uh, rockets and uh, uh, the areas with the, the most tension you got on the news. But uh, we had um, also some different kind of tension uh, between the Arab population and Jewish population inside of Israel, especially in mixed cities like Haifa, where I live. Uh, Haifa is actually uh, the symbol of coexistence in Israel between Arabs and Jews. Uh, but this uh, was uh, kind of shattered the past two weeks um, because of the events. Um, <clears throat> we had uh, uh, on the 13th of May, after uh, all the riots and uh, problems that have been taking place in different villages and uh, cities, um, an organized group of uh, right extremists um, supported by uh, the government and the police, protected by the police, coming into uh, Arab neighborhoods, uh, uh, chasing uh, Arabs uh, and uh, threatening, attacking, harming, and now, uh, this was, um, uh, the claim is that this is a reaction for what the uh, Arabs inside of Israel did a day or two before with the burning uh, garbage cans, attacking uh, Jews on the street. Uh, but what was terrible for us, uh, like my neighborhood in Haifa is one of the most peaceful uh, neighborhoods, uh, um, to see that these gangs outside of Haifa coming into the neighborhoods protected as i said by the police letting them into the neighborhoods attacking screaming uh, uh, planting fear among the uh, the arab uh, citizens with uh, calls like death to arab burn your villages uh, we want to teach you how to stay at home in and live in fear we are the bosses of this land and the police did nothing and once uh, somebody from the Arab houses that has been attacked went out to try and protect himself, the police immediately started shooting uh, sound bombs, tear gas, and arresting them, while uh, the extremists did, uh, were not uh, even uh, pushed. And uh, uh, also bad was that our mayor and our leaders um, in the city uh, the first night, or when this night happened, they disappeared. They did nothing just till the next day where, where people started seeing that this is something very bad. Uh, this is something that can leave a scar for a long time, especially in cities like Haifa. This doesn't support at all all the work for coexistence between Arabs and uh, Jewish uh, uh, inside of Israel. The police started acting a little bit different. Uh, we started seeing patrols in our uh, neighborhoods. The mayor went down to the streets and started trying to calm. But um, what, what really was significant in this, that uh, when all the leaders, political leaders, the religious leaders were, were not on the scene, uh, youth and uh, simple people just took initiatives to try uh, and uh, help bring uh, calm things down and uh, uh, supporting those who are feeling that they are threatened or are living in fear. Now, so this is what has been having, uh, happening. Jamal, the, the, the gangs um, came to your house and asked you, are you Arab, I understand, and attacked your neighbor's homes. Um, can mm -hmm. you say a little bit more about that? Yeah, so what I experienced is, uh, as you said, um, I, we, we got a notice that the, those, kind, those gangs will uh, attack in our neighborhood. So um, uh, older people from the neighborhood they gathered and made a meeting, especially for the youth, uh, in order not to, to, to create more tension and not uh, to, to, to bring to clashes. Uh, so we said everybody should stay around his house, 
protect his house if anything is happening, anybody is attacking, but uh, don't go and uh, confront outside of, of your houses. Just let the thing pass and let the police deal with it. And I was standing on the edge of, uh, of the street, uh, just in front of my home. I saw suspicious cars coming in, stopping, coming down with bats, masks uh, on their faces, uh, uh, shouting all over. And then they looked at me and asked me, are you an Arab? And started uh, turning towards me. I went a little bit uh, down towards my house where my brothers were all, all there. And we stood there together uh, showing that we are going to protect, but don't, don't uh, come uh, like, we are not coming to attack, just to, we are protecting. And they didn't come near us, uh, fortunately, but they attacked the house beside us. And then uh, there were shots heard. And that's only when the police interfered and uh, started uh, 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 pushing this gang outside of the neighborhood. Uh, until two hours later, another gang came from the neighboring neighborhood uh, shouting and screaming. That's when the neighbors uh, called the police and the police came and intervened again. Uh, but since then, we have all the time patrols go going through the neighborhood, uh, watching every, every message from the group in the neighborhood at night, uh, just wait, uh, uh, alerting everybody. So it was really tense uh, time in a city which is the coexistence uh, example in all israel right and this was the abnormal well i i want to bring back sarah in here because i think for many of us um for those who don't know me i'm half palestinian i lived outside bethlehem um for years in ramallah i worked on the negotiations um and have worked on this issue you know for much of my professional life i think um the rockets are are what we see in the news. As we know, there were a number of things that precipitated um, the, the rockets and the airstrikes. Um, and, um, but one of the things that feels unusual about this latest escalation is the street violence that we've seen between citizens within Israel, between Arabs and Jews. Mm -hmm. And Sarah, I know this is something that you've worked on for many years, but as a student of the conflict and somebody who's lived there myself, I don't think we've seen anything on this scale since the 1920s or the 1940s. This, this feels new and different. And what's happening and what does this mean? And, and how do we get past this if in fact this is a new phase in this conflict? Uh, yes, absolutely. In many, many ways, what was happening in the past two weeks was nothing new. We've been through Gaza being bombed and totally destroyed and, and an astonishing amount of victims per day. We've seen violence in the West Bank, we've seen violence uh, in East Jerusalem. Those are things that somehow we expect to happen every few years because our leadership doesn't do anything to avoid the thing from happening again. And even the, the ceasefire and the game around ceasefire, yes or no, and both sides claiming victory, that's something we've seen many, many times already. But the new thing for many people and something that was I would say for the mainstream media and kind of like the average person in the street of Tel Aviv, uh, to see violence among citizens of Israel was very new. But the truth is that when you were working with those population, with population of Palestinian citizens of Israel and Jews within Israel, for years you could see that tension coming because it's true that tension between different groups don't look the same in every country. And so I know that I had friends coming from Europe or from the US and like, oh, see like those Arab doctors and those Jewish doctors working side by side or um, road workers who are praying together by the side of the road, but different prayers, one Muslim, one Jewish, look this coexistence, it's beautiful. But that's not the issue we have here in my view. Our issue is not coexistence. Our issue is recognizing two narratives, two stories, two identities that are both already very multiple and diverse in the same land. And what we've seen since the creation of Israel is the constant erasure of the Palestinian identity, history, narrative, and presence. And also the division of the Palestinian population. So 
Palestinian citizens of Israel will be called Arab Israelis in a way that disconnects them from Palestinians in Gaza or in, in the West Bank. But the truth is that this population, and I don't want to speak in the name of Palestinian citizens of Israel, so Jamal, correct me and you'll complete later. But for most people, it was, co oh, we coexist. We have mixed cities. Look, Arabs, Jews working together. True, hospitals are full of us working together. But that's not the issue here. And what we've seen in the past few years, and it was growing, and what kind of erupted in the past two weeks was that, um, that eruption of Palestinian identity within the Arab population of Israel. And that for many people was a surprise and that the police treated in the most violent way. Because if you're supporting Palestinians in Gaza, if you're supporting Palestinians in the West Bank or in Sherjara, then you're a threat, you're a terrorist. And we saw methodology of police officers within Israel against citizens of Israel that are usually used in the West Bank. And so for many people, and of course, you can call them rioters, because of course, some of them were of those demonstrators, Palestinian demonstrations within Israel were incredibly violent. But in the Israeli news, there was no room given to the fact that this is a Palestinian story that, that is being rewritten by an entire generation of young Palestinians who are taking control over their identity. And that's something that was entirely missing in um, Israeli mainstream media, that it was more complex than just Arab rioters against the police. Well, and I, I think that's something that we also missed in the media here. And I, um, you know, you mentioned the, the multiplicity of narratives on the ground, the many Israeli and the many Palestinian narratives. And yet, you know, people interpret sort of the, the realities that we're seeing through these lenses. And so for many Israeli Jews, this, these centuries of persecution and um, this fighting for existence, the rockets um, and any support of Palestinian rights is sometimes unfortunately conflated as to sort of another existential attack. And then for Palestinians, this constant erasure of their land, I think, you know, Sheikh Jarrah, where um, this, many believe the spark for this came, where families are about to be forcibly removed from their homes, Palestinian families, of course, is harkens back to the founding of the state of Israel and the expulsion of the majority of the local Palestinian population. So that's how Palestinians see it. Um, in the West, that was co covered as a property dispute, even though, as we all know, there's a law that allows Jews and only Jews to reclaim la lands from prior to 1948. And so highlighting the fact that, you know, we have these different narratives, and yet at the same time, there's a particular reality on the ground in which one group um, has um, ultimately control, power uh, over the other. But Jamal, I'm, I'm curious, you know, you and your family have been in this work of ministry within Haifa. Um, you have the first halfway house um, in Israel, um, which, uh, which was modeled later by the state and, and serves um, uh, Palestinian citizens of Israel, Muslims, Christians, Jews. Um, historically, you come from a Christian family and this is a Christian ministry. Now you're seeing the fray of Haifa's sort of fabric and Israel's fabric. Um, what is, are you seeing any hope in this current moment? Um, now that we have the ceasefire, how do we, how do we repair some of this or rather than repair, how do we weave um, more representative and full um, society in which all of Israel's citizens and the people under its control can know security, dignity, and freedom? And you're on mute again, sorry. <laughs> um, so actually, in, in, as I said, in, in Haifa, the, the, uh, 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 it has been always, we had some difficult times. We had in the second intifada in the year 2000, uh, we had in the uh, Leb second Lebanon war um, in 2006, and then uh, again, 2014, we had the tension happening because after all, we are human beings. You, you, you are uh, at one side, and then you have the other side, and it's very easy always to make it to make the issues. It's uh, Palestinians in Gaza and West Bank, uh, uh, including us against the Jewish. You know, 
it's, it's very easy to do that, uh, but uh, the, the issue is a little bit more complex, especially for Palestinians inside of Israel, as Sarah mentioned in many topics. But the, 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 the strong structure of the multicultural uh, existence in Haifa has always been able to, uh, uh, for, not to forget, but to put the, the, the tension behind us and continue to live together. Like my, my brother, he has a small restaurant in Wadi Nisnas, once, you know, one of the Arab neighborhoods where usually if any tension between Arabs and uh, Jewish happen in Haifa, this is the first spot to get uh, 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 the, the ricochets because all the Arab stores, restaurants are local there. So many of the Jewish who came to eat, to buy there, they are not coming anymore because they are afraid. Uh, uh, but my brother was telling me the whole two weeks, despite all tension, a lot of his customers, Jewish customers from Haifa, still came and made posts and uh, shared uh, the time that they are, uh, they are not scared and they are do, uh, doing the normal things they did also before the tension. So Haifa was always this, this place where things could, uh, uh, could, uh, go back to normal very fast, but we see that every time there's tension, it, it explodes again very, uh, very easily. And that shows that there is something lacking there. It's not only coexistence to be beside each other, go and eat at each other's restaurant. And this is how we live together. There's a lack of communication be be between the, 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 the groups, uh, not knowing the other. Uh, not understanding the mentality, not understanding the, 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 the challenges that different groups are facing. And this is the main issue. And this has to be uh, raised up. This has to be talked about. And nobody is doing that. It's, it's always nice to talk about coexistence, celebrating Christmas, Hanukkah, and Ramadan, or whatever together, bringing nice photos, and that's it. And after that, Nobody is talking about really how we live together and what are the needs of each, each group. And this is why the tension keeps coming back. And on that, we need to work. Education is very important. Um, the dialogue is very important. Uh, and, and unfortunately, because of the um, past few years where the government, where you have a, a right a strong right wing that is bringing all the time that Arabs are suspicious, Arabs are enemy, don't trust them, and so on. You know, this built up and makes it very difficult to, to make a stand and say, no, I'm a Jew, I want to talk to Arabs. Arabs are my neighbors, they are good people. This brings you immediately to be under attack, to be a traitor, even as a Jew inside the Jewish community, you know? Um, and I think the events, what happened lately, and what I see in the reaction in the in the talk uh, uh, talkbacks in uh, all all different kind of newspapers and so, like till before three weeks, four weeks ago, you will see ninety percent, ninety five percent racist comments again when something is uh, mentioning Arab problem, you know, in uh, but the events, it's, it was like a slap for those who understand and know that we need to live in coexistence and we are not enemies to start speak up and say your uh, your uh, write your thoughts uh, talk up and say, uh, say that it's it's possible to live together and i see that there's a tendency to re read more such positive uh, comments and reactions than what we, we had before the the incidents we had and this is something a uh, very, uh, you know, bringing a lot of hope. And uh, it shows that people started understanding that just being enemies all the time, attacking each other, not understanding what's what's happening, just putting uh, the opposite side as an enemy all the time will not help us to, to, to bring, bring or build those bridges where we can come together and start living together truly. Okay, we can still have disagreements. Yes, we, as Palestinians, we still have some rights uh, that uh, are not uh, being respected by the government. Like I, I'm, a I'm sure that in many uh, uh, mixed cities where Arabs uh, went out to the streets and show a lot of aggression, and yes, we condemn this kind of aggression 
against people, against uh, property. But it's not for me to, to stand there now every day if I go on the news or if I write anything, I always have to ask for forgiveness for what happened and forget what brought those people to go out and do these things. I'm against violence, but we also have to understand all the, uh, 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 the laws that have been put in uh, to uh, make it not possible for Arabs to uh, build, for example, to find jobs. All the issue of violence inside the Arab community where you have an unlicensed weapon and the police is doing any, uh, nothing against it. You know, right. and now when these weapons were turned against Jews, ah, somebody woke up and said we need to act. So right. all these issues are not mentioned in the news, are not putting put in on on the on the table, and uh, we need to start addressing those issues. Well, I, Jamal, I'm I'm very you know, I've been learning from you for years, and I, I think what you're saying resonates deep deeply about sort of condemning all forms of violence, and we often talk about violence and nonviolence. And we'll often just talk about direct violence, the punch, the bullet, the rocket, but there's also structural violence and there's also cultural violence. And what is that? Structural violence is something like a system of apartheid or of occupation or of slate where you rule, you have laws and force that put people in different, that's violence too. Um, and often when we're talking about Israel-Palestine, we're just condemning this direct violence. We're not looking at the structural violence or the cultural violence. Cultural violence, an example of that is anti-Semitism or Islamophobia or these attitudes or these mobs chanting death to Arabs in the streets. It's not actually that punch. It's not something with the force of law, but it's something that shapes our attitudes. And without anti-Semitic viewpoints, for example, you can't have something like the Holocaust. People have to be able to be open to doing these horrible things to their fellow human beings. So I think that's um, I, I think it's important to highlight both what violence is and that nonviolence, the choice of nonviolence, is not passivity, um, um, but it's actually going out and forcing some creative tension to transform uh, to transform our world. I see a number of questions coming into the chat, and I encourage you to put those in. I'd also like to remind you we have ongoing webinar series um, uh, every every week, so we'll be talking to. Um, uh, Oscar-nominated director Farah, Farah Nabulsi about her film The Present next week. We'll be talking also to grassroots activists. Um, today, Jamal and Sara are both citizens of Israel, and they're giving us a, a perspective of what it's like to be in Israel right now. Um, and Sarah, I, I want to put that question back to you, um, because you have so much work in this space, a decade of of working and trying to cross divides among communities within Israel. 20% of Israel's population is Arab, Palestinian citizens of Israel, um, and the 80% who's Jewish, they don't live with equality right now. Um, and sometimes that inequality is quite, quite stark. But what do you see as sort of you know, ways forward now that this, this next layer within Israel feels if it's, as it's been breached? Where, where is the emphasis of your work? I will take a step uh, back to, to get to your question. So I promise I will answer you. I also would like to say thank you to those new people who opened their camera, very, very nice. And also to those people who were triggered by the word apartheid, please don't leave. Uh, we can also talk about it later because uh, I saw some faces and I understand uh, what reaction it can generate. Uh, so absolutely. Um, so we don't live the same reality because we don't learn the same story. We don't learn the same history. We are not triggered by the same things. We don't have the same traumas. We are not linked to the same narratives. So the result is that if I'm talking to, I don't know, maybe Jamal's friends or family and I'm talking to my family, they live in, they live in totally different realities. They didn't receive the same news about the same events for the past two weeks. But also, if you go to Palestinian school or Israeli schools, you have the same map. It's just not the same name. So how do we do when we, we keep creating those parallel narratives and realities? The news are creating them live. Our leaders are creating them live. How can both sides be victorious? But that's the reality that they are both claiming. So we are not triggered by the same things. And so we're not living the same reality at all. 
And so systemic oppression happens when, especially when in our case, the oppressive majority, he's filled with trauma and fear. And you mentioned earlier the existential fear of Israeli Jews, which is what is partly the motivation of the creation of the country, but also constantly used by politicians. And that is in every Israeli Jew DNA. So we see every aggression against us. And I say we roughly, I don't know there anymore, but we see every aggression as an antisemitic aggression, as an aggression against our Jewishness. And so about our existence in our presence on this land. So, and, it, and so we see every Palestinian flag as an aggression against our Jewish presence, as if it can be only one or the other, as if the Palestinian narrative and identity was a threat uh, to my Jewish presence and my Israeli identity, which is not the case, but that's how things are seen from the Jewish side. And so people are gen like are genuinely terrified by any um, picture, video, news of violence coming from the West Bank, East Jerusalem, from Palestinian citizens of Israel or from Gaza, because everything is linked to that interpretation of my existence is an issue, they want to erase me. When a lot of those things are happening are just linked to we want recognition for our identity as Palestinians. It doesn't necessarily mean we don't exist. So that's the context that we come from first. So we don't see the same reality and we don't live the same reality and we don't react to the same events in the same way. And I'm now, I'm sorry, Gregory, can you remind me of your question? <laughs> oh, I, 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 given that reality, um, where, where are you putting your energies? Yes, um, exactly. Uh, so, where do we go from there? And do I see hope? First, I can't uh, afford not to have hope. And, um, and I think that in many ways, what is happening today is a necessary step away from pretending that the status quo is acceptable. Uh, because the more we won't see Palestinian citizens of Israel as nice Arab Israelis, the better it will be for, her, for the majority and the leadership in Israel to understand that the issue is not only us against them, but how do we all live together because nobody's living. And to me, it was particularly moving to see Palestinian youth having all those peaceful protests, singing together, rallying for just their story to be told and to be known and to be recognized here. And even though it was not well interpreted by mainstream Jewish Israeli media, I th still think that it's a, it's a step in the right way. Well, that's something we may have missed too. So I think many of us missed the, um, the mob vi mi violence, but um, there were also demonstrations, significant demonstrations all over Israel, uh, joint demonstrations uh, for a different way forward. Can you say something about exactly. that? Yes, and also, so the status quo is not acceptable and also a lot of peace organization and I'm part of the peace field in Israel, Palestine, but uh, a lot of those organizations were kind of working in the understanding that we ha just have to be friends. It's just about coexistence. We can't pretend that that's the issue anymore. The issue is equality and justice. Those are the issues. Those are the issues are about acknowledging multiple stories and that multiple stories and identities can live together in this land and having the same rights. It's not us against them. It's about how do we both live, all of us live together. Uh, so I think that's in a way how extreme this violence was and how divisive it was, was a wake up call for many peace activists, okay. but also for many uh, to be more active and not only to be to sustain the status quo in a way, but to be more, um, I don't want to say extreme, but that's kind of where I want to go. Like, it's not only about friend, being friends, it's about dismantling a system of inequality and calling it for what it is. Right. At Telosum, uh, we have the principles and practices of peacemaking, which I referenced earlier. 
Our th third principle is justice. Peace and justice are intertwined. As Dr. King said, peace is not the absence of tension, but it's the presence of justice. And I think we, whether it's in Israel, Palestine or elsewhere, understanding that embodying these principles um, in active ways and remedying these injustices um, are, are critical if we're serious about making peace and not just singing around and sharing some hummus and um, singing Kumbaya. Um, but I, I wanna get to some of the questions. We have a lot of uh, questions in here. Um, I'm going to start just this morning. Ceasefire was announced last night. We turn on our televisions this morning. We see, um, we see clashes again um, at Al-Aqsa Mosque, the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. That of course is um, what Hamas um, uses as the excuse to start firing rockets again. Um, what's going on? Is this a, is, is, is this a real ceasefire? Um, or do, you, do you feel that this is going to escalate again? Can you comment on what's happening? Maybe Jamal. Um, <clears throat> today, today actually, I took a little bit break of the news because uh, the news in the last two weeks, really, uh, especially in the Israeli uh, station, it was very much uh, one-sided and uh, very much aggressive. Um, so I didn't hear about the clashes again. But uh, if we go back to the past, I mean, uh, it has been always same old story, uh, provocation, attack, uh, uh, war, uh, then each side is declaring he's winning, uh, trying to get a ceasefire just uh, to, to calm things down because uh, all kind of pressure from all over around. But again, the problem, the issues are not being treated. Right. And uh, you, you cannot uh, expect that when the, uh, the, the, the problem is still there uh, and uh, always being, uh, um, I would say, like putting wood to the fire, just uh, growing and growing and growing, and, and at what some point it will explode again. And we've seen that happening again and again and again. It's serving agendas of both sides who are trying to stay in control. This is my opinion, okay? Right. Because the whole issue of Gaza, it wasn't the issue at the moment, okay? I think the Hamas used that to show again that we are here. Uh, we are the protectors of Palestine because uh, the, the elections were canceled and there they were expecting to have, uh, you know, uh, more power in the Palestinian uh, territories. Mm -hmm. uh, they were disappointed, I guess, uh, and used the opportunity to start attacking. On the Israeli side, Benjamin Netanyahu lost the mandate to, uh, to, to start the government. Uh, he his position is very has been very weak. You have the trial trial against him, uh, so uh, we need to to find a way to 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 uh, put the sides now to uh, or uh, to concentrate on something else, and that's when it happens. That that's when the, every everything all uh, citizens uh, that have been going through a lot of injustice on both sides, okay? Um, and then, yeah, we will uh, do, uh, do the explosions, uh, send rockets, uh, bomb, and uh, we will sit to talk again, and nothing is happening really to solve the issues. And this is, this is sad, especially for me as a Christian, as a Palestinian, as an Israeli citizen, to see that happening again, again and again without looking for the road to reach the peace, reach the, uh, the, uh, the place where we can live uh, side by side without uh, hurting each other, uh, it's, it's very disappointing. Yeah, I know, and I appreciate you both referencing the lack of a status quo, because I think particularly, you know, going back to normal was never an option for Palestinians in, in Gaza, for example, um, a place that I know and, and love. My grandmother was from Gaza. Um, and we're going to have another webinar specifically on Gaza with folks from Gaza in, um, in the coming weeks. So we can get more of those stories too. Um, I, you, we, we're getting a, a lot of um, um, questions in here. But one thing I just wanted to get your reaction to quickly is um, the ceasefire to what feels different um, for me about this is how quick it happened. So last time there was a major escalation in 2014. 
Um, it took 50 days and thousands died. This time it was 10 days and lamentably, lamentably hundreds dead um, who we can never get back. But this happened in a much shorter period of time. And I'm wondering, you know, we've seen different outpourings, particularly here in the US of a different approach to Israel-Palestine and more calls for equality and, and justice. And uh, do, do, any of you, do either of you think that that may have had an impact on people raising their vo voices, including many on this call? Um, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead, uh, sure. Jamal, you okay? Yeah. Uh, I am absolutely sure that it had a huge impact. And I think that we already saw it before because it was those past few years have been incredibly important all around the world about civil society getting organized and demonstrating for justice and equality. And again, all over the world. And there are channels of communication happening between different groups. And the Black Lives Matter movement have been in touch with demonstrators in Balfour and with Palestinian demonstrators, because it's about the same police brutality that we had to fight. Mm -hmm. And so suddenly people, thanks to social media, sometimes there can be used for good. There was this feeling of we belong to this, like we are fighting the same struggle. We are trying to dismantle old system that give us different value depending on who we are and we want to dismantle those. And if it's about the United States, if it's about Europe, if it's about feminist issues, environmental issues, or if it's about Black Lives Matter or Palestinian rights, or fighting corruption in Israel with the Balfour demonstrations, there is something in common. And people were communicating and people were following each other on social media. And so suddenly there was this sense of community that was created and also of uh, solidarity. I'm going to help you. I will give you tips. And I think that also social media allowed the Palestinian youth to be more organized and also peace activists in Israel, Palestine, Jews and Palestinian to kind of see different ways of action. And that just playing the game of the status quo was not enough. Yeah. And in reaction, people knew right away what was happening because we were following each other already. And so the communication around what was happening was not only the monopole of mainstream media of CNN or Fox News, but what's happening in social media. And that created a new dialogue, a new reaction, and a new view on what's happening that didn't happen in 2014 or before. I, I wanna hold um, something here and then, then bring in another question. Um, one is what you said that you think it had a huge impact that people like on this call raising their voice calling for a ceasefire had an impact so many of us feel that we don't have agency in this that this terrible tragedy continues to unfold and there's nothing we can do and yet we see that voices coming up on behalf of both Israelis and Palestinians but fundamental human rights centering fundamental human rights created enough um, pressure to likely halt this escalation um, weeks before otherwise would have ended. Um, and so, so I just want to name that because don't, don't, no one should ever walk away from this call again thinking that like that uncomfortable conversation or that phone call to your um, representative or that letter is not worth it. It is. And we see that um, today, whether or not this ceasefire um, holds. But we're getting a, a skeptical question in here. Um, two questions I want to bring together. One, how realistic is changing the situation towards equality and justice um, when Israeli politicians continue to become more extreme, supporting settlers and further property annexation? So that's from Mohanad Malas. And then another question earlier on that I saw was trying to, you know, wondering if there's a link between how. Israel Palestine is viewed and does this does this resemble colonialism in other parts of the world and indigenous indigenous people fighting for independence and dignity and that's a question that comes up a lot in I think uh, circles on on the left and I'm wondering how you would you'd, you'd you'd balance both of you would react to those one is a move towards equality and justice um, is that actually realistic sometime soon and then Two, you know, should we completely reframe this through through a different lens, or is that inaccurate or unhelpful? And specifically, the lens of colonialism, because that's a that's a charged question, I think, for many. 
So maybe um, Jamal, do you want to take the uh -huh. first question about like you know is it realistic to to move to, to a space of you know equality and justice um, in in Israel or or is that still sort of a pipe dream? Um, it's it's a very difficult question, and uh, uh, the reality at the moment might show you that uh, this is uh, something that's still far to reach. But as as we said and we mentioned. There is a tendency to, to have a, a different way of approach. There is a, a different voices that have been raised lately. Uh, and this is, this is something we need to continue going on to, in order to change uh, the balance from right wing into the center, at least, you know, to, to, make it, uh, to make it part of the dialogue, which is something now that it's not existing. Any word you say that it's not, uh, in the same level with the uh, ma ma mainstream now at the moment, it puts you in a very, very bad position and you are afraid to talk about it. So, um, but me personally, I never gave, gave up hope. This is something that motivates me. This is something that uh, keeps me uh, going on in uh, uh, continuing uh, this uh, this way of work, even through our, my ministry or in, in my private uh, life, uh, every time uh, just saying that there is no other solution than to make it realistic, this uh, equality, this uh, 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 bringing people to live together, there is no other solution because otherwise we will stay in this conflict and we will stay fighting each other without understanding, without coming closer in order to at least uh, realize, hear, listen, understand what's going on the other side. So I will never give up hope, despite all difficulties and all uh, uh, situation that we see and might might show that it's it's not possible at the moment. Yeah, uh, can I? I yes, go? please. Yeah. Uh, I totally agree with what Jamal said. Uh, I also want to keep in perspective that as insane as it seems to say, it's still a very young conflict. I mean, countries over in Europe, in the West, in South America, in Asia have been fighting for centuries um, before they could settle down on, oh, wait, maybe we can just live there together. And it's a very young conflict and we're still settling down in our identities. And of course, like the arc of, history bends toward justice. It's just full of zig and zags. And we can't afford to keep that in mind. So I believe that yes, it seems awful right now. And we have, I mean, I'm gonna speak in the name of Israeli Jews. Our government is basically shaking hands with the people who did kill Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin 30 years ago. That's how far right we moved. But I also think that it's forcing us to understand that we can't continue in the same way, that we need to make drastic change if we want everyone to live peacefully in safety. There is no peace, safety, or justice for Israeli Jews if there is not peace, justice, and safety for Palestinians. And we're getting slowly there. Right. Well, and, and I well, I, I see the, the, the tide shifting in an unusual places, you know, here in the United States, um, new, um, new uh, Christian voices out there um, who are unequivocally pro-Israel um, in a very hard line sense um, are emerging, um, new forms of activism, the progressive left is becoming very engaged here. And so there's minority on the ground, but many people thought this wouldn't happen. Now the discourse is centering human rights. It's not trying to avoid the reality on the ground, which is a two-tiered system um, in which, you know, Israeli Jews, um, whether in Israel or the West Bank, including Jerusalem, Gaza Strip, are ultimately in control of Palestinian lives who don't right. have the same, same rights. And, and that discourse is shifting quite rapidly. But I guess, you know, you know, as we're closing nearing the end of this, this call here, um, what can we do? I mean, what are some action points that we can take today to help advance 
the change in discourse, but also to support some of the people, the, the realities on the ground, um, especially um, in, in Gaza and, and places where, where people were, um, were particularly hard hit. Um, I want to encourage everyone, I'm gonna like photo people you don't agree with. Follow, like it's so important to get our information from as many sources of information as we can because it will allow you to see the reality through the lens of other people. And so if you do want to reach an audience that is not exactly already agreeing with you, you will know what language to use and what will trigger them. So I think that keeping yourself informed and educated, it's really our responsibility. And today with social media and internet, we have no excuse not to seek different source of information. Even people you disagree with, just go there just to see what's happening. And then of course, UNRWA is doing amazing work for Gaza. Uh, like you can donate money if you can afford to do so. There are organizations that are supporting right now people in Gaza and in the West Bank. And also look for those peace organizations in the ground or movement like Standing Together that has done very impressive work in the past few years in Israel, Palestine. So try to seek those people you can support follow and also force yourself to follow people you hate <laughs> because or just disagree with because it will really like give you an understanding on what has to be changed and how sure um jamal yeah um so um i i i agree i mean what i wanted to to say is that um, um it is very important to reach out in, in person to people, to listen to stories from different uh, backgrounds. Uh, this is the only way uh, to, to, to understand the reality, even if there are is the disagreements. And uh, the best way, I think one of the things that affected uh, this uh, uh, shift in the way of thinking and way of reacting, the social media, the youth uh, uh, being active on the social media and not the mainstream news, which was is one-sided, either to the Palestinian side or to the Israeli. We, we, if we want to serve the case, the issue, we cannot be one-sided. I can have an opinion support one side, but I have to understand the other. And this is happening when I listen to more stories, more uh, backgrounds. Uh, and this is what needs to be done. And of course, uh, the support to those all, uh, the, that have been suffering from, uh, from the violence that we uh, had uh, uh, recently, uh, this is something uh, to do to rebuild what was destroyed um, and work, uh, what's very important to work on these connections, these, these uh, uh, and uh, as I said before, as well, the, the education, if you feel any organization, any group is working for educating the youth, uh, the people uh, to come towards each other and understand, listen to each other. This is something that needs to be uh, supported in order for us to reach uh, the goal we all hope for, uh, the peace in, in a very fast way. I wanna thank you both for this rich conversation. We could speak for, for hours and to encourage people to engage in the ways that you, you recommend to donate, to listen, to share stories. I'd, I'd like to, um, I'd, I'd like to um, end with just a couple of very quick thoughts um, from, from, from Telos here. One, remember your voice does matter on this issue. There is not going to be any significant shift in Israel-Palestine unless there's a shift in the way America and international community engages. We're part and party of this conflict. Um, we've incorporated it into our own culture and our politics. You can't get elected a member of Congress without taking a position on this issue, but we are also a player on the ground, um, sending billions of dollars a year um, to both Israel and the Palestinians. And so your voice absolutely matters. We saw that with the ceasefire. So share, make sure you share your stories with your friends and family even when it's uncomfortable. Think of our friends here and what they've lived through and the many other friends we've been talking to and will talk over these last weeks. Um, our discomfort is critical in building a new movement that centers uh, human rights 
um, for the way in which we view Israel, Israel and the Palestinians. That's the only way forward. There's no way forward, a good future for anyone there with a good future for everyone there. And, and to get there, we have to recognize these injustices on the ground that we so often just want to ignore because they feel so far above us. So share, donate in the short term um, to folks who are suffering if you can. I know a lot of us suffered this last year and we don't have those resources, but reach out to your friends, send notes of support if you can't send money. Um, but also if you don't want to donate to causes on the ground directly, we have a Peacemakers Fund at Telos. If you click on our donate website, just click very specifically um, to uh, the Peacemakers Fund. All 100% of those funds will go directly to partners on the ground. Um, and I want you to stay engaged. This is not the beginning. The ceasefire is not the end of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The ceasefire, we can celebrate it and the fact that many lives have been spared. But the reality is that this, this lamentable situation on the ground continues, often with the support of our government and for many of this on this call, our faith communities. Um, as peacemakers, we own our agency and responsibility. We know that a future in which mutual flourishing is possible. And so it's our duty, if we truly believe in the fundamental value of all human life, to work towards that and to form unusual relationships across lines of dif difference. In Israel-Palestine, that works means working for mutual flourishing for Israelis Palis and Palestinians, Muslims, Christians, and Jews. That's before and beyond one state, two state. There's new movement, there's new moment. We're at the head of this. I know we can do this. There's a lot of suffering to unfortunately um, ahead, but a transformation is possible, especially if all of us on this call do our part and do our role. So thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Jamal, for showing the way. So appreciative. Um, we can't wait to follow your work, partner with you, and to come visit you in person as borders open, hopefully in more peaceful times. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.